Good morning, everyone. Um, so that's my pleasure to present you this uh, research project together with Laurent Barras from Luxembourg University, Patrick Gagliardini from Lugano in Switzerland, and Olivier Skayev from Geneva. So basically what we do uh, in this uh, research, the goal of this research, we take the viewpoint of, of an investor and we have a very simple objective in mind. We'd like to decompose the average hedge fund return into two components. One component, which is the alpha component, uh, which is unique to the fund, um, and the fund will exploit its private information in order, in order to generate some performance. And the second uh, component, which is the beta uh, component, comes from the ability of the fund to replicate uh, some mechanical trading strategies in order to boost uh, its return. And here, the fund is, is typically exploiting uh, public information. Decomposing this average performance into the beta and the alpha component is obviously uh, very important, typically for performance and, and risk management. Both components are potentially large. Uh, there are many, many studies that have reported uh, large significant alpha generated by hedge funds. And also when you talk to hedge fund manager, uh, you have ample anecdotal evidence that they actually boost their returns by following exotic or alternative trading strategies. Now, you would, you would agree that uh, hedge funds are typically more heterogeneous or diverse than uh, mutual funds. And we claim that capturing this heterogeneity uh, is very important for several reasons. First, from an investment viewpoint, if you have the distribution of the performance in term, in, instead of a single average estimate, well, you may benchmark your investments as compared to the overall universe. Right, so capturing individual fund alpha is very important for investors that typically only invest in a few funds. Now, this heterogeneity on the beta side is, is also important because it tells it tell us something about the, the exposure of a fund. So from a risk management viewpoint, it's important to know exactly what are the beta, uh, so the exposure to, to some of the trading strategies for each fund. And then on a theory side, uh, it helps, this decomposition actually helps uh, sharpen uh, theoretic um, testing um, equilibrium models in asset management. So here, the goal of the paper is, is to come up with a methodology to get a sense about the entire alpha beta component distribution across funds, instead of looking simply at, at an average. Now, the challenge that everyone actually is facing when dealing with hedge funds is that, as I mentioned before, they are really heterogeneous and they are heterogeneous because they deploy several types of strategies. So they, they invest in different types of asset classes, they invest in different countries, some of them leverage a lot, use leverage, others uh, follow dynamic uh, strategies. So when, when you would like to take a benchmark model to assess the risk and the performance of these hedge funds, I mean, it's likely that you will be missing some of the factors that the funds are exposed to. And as such, you will take a wrong model. Or if you want more formally, you will use a misspecified model. A model that omits some of the relevant factor, uh, factors that drive uh, the hedge fund returns. So we need to account for this mis misspecification because it has, it has huge impact on, on this decomposition. Actually, this is what we propose. We show it has a dual uh, impact. On one side, it will first lead to the imperfect identification or measurement of the alpha and the beta part. And here the explanation is pretty, pretty simple, is that if part of the performance is explained by some factor exposure, some beta exposure, and that you omit those exposure in your factor model, then it will inflate the alpha component. And as such, you will, get, you will get a high alpha, which is nothing else than hidden betas. So for that, we come up with a, our solution is to come up with a formal comparison test where we will be using several factors, factor models, and we will be comparing them 
and I, I, I hope I, I convince you that through this comparison, you can isolate models that are more likely to capture the relevant factor and therefore more able to deliver the right, uh, the right message regarding the alpha part and the beta part. So that's one side, imperfect estimation. The other problem that you have with mass specification is that the alpha beta distribution that we will get will be noisy. Noisy in the sense that the omitted factor that is not present in your, in your set of factors in your regression model will affect, will impact all the funds residuals. And as such, there won't be any diversification in the cross section. Uh, so the noise will not vanish. And for that, you need the proper economic theory to see exactly what's going on uh, when you don't have this uh, vanishing property as n uh, grows large, uh, and how you can come up with a proper sound uh, theory. And this is a major part uh, of the paper that, that is developed. Now, before digging into the theory a bit, let me just sketch the set of results that, uh, that we obtain. So the first, first thing that we do, we will take a set of standard models, factor models that have been used for decades in the hedge fund space. And we will compare those models together against the most, the, the simplest model you can imagine, which is the CAPM. That actually has a, a single factor, which is the market. And the CAPM is clearly the, the most illiquid model that you can imagine to capture the alternative strategies that are most of the time very low correlated with the, with the market, right? So we will compare those set of models against the CAPM. And what we find is actually those models deliver exactly the same alpha distribution. So the additional factors provided by these models do not add any value for disentangling the alpha and the beta uh, part or component. So basically those factors, they are not relevant for hedge funds. Then we propose uh, two alternative uh, factor models by using alternative factors. And I will tell you more about those factors later in, uh, during the presentation. But typically those factors uh, were isolated as being relevant for, for, for H1, the way they trade, uh, typically using carry uh, trading strategy or investing you know, in mean reversion or momentum type of strategies. And when you, when you compare those models against the CAPM here, you see a massive difference. So you see that there is a strong shift of the alpha distribution to the left, so towards zero. So those factors seems to capture part, part of, the, of the performance. So what you observe, you observe more beta and less alpha with those uh, factor models. And, and, and so it, it completely changes the narrative as compared to using the standard models. What we do as well, we, we look at the hedge fund performance over time. So we, we run a dynamic analysis. And what we observe is that uh, over the recent periods, uh, hedge funds have, 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 have look more and more uh, like uh, mutual funds in terms of their performance. So the alpha decreases over time and their exposure to the market uh, has increased since the financial crisis. It's interesting to look as well uh, at the heterogeneity of the alpha and the beta components. They vary a lot. They vary a lot as well within styles. So even if you look at only narrow strategies for hedge funds like equity, macro or arbitrage strategies, within these subcategories, you see a lot of heterogeneity uh, between alpha uh, estimates and the beta estimates. And therefore this raise, I mean, a flag a warning flag when you will be using indices, uh, you know, uh, style indices when benchmarking your strategies. You need more. You need a factor model that is really designed for uh, the fund that you have in your portfolio. Also, the alpha and beta are negatively correlated. And this is even more true for the left tail of the alpha distribution. So the left tail of the alpha distribution means the, the worst funds. So the worst fund seems to load a lot on the alternative strategies. And here the message is a bit, is a bit that the worst funds seems to hide uh, their lack, lack of skills by loading a lot on alternative strategies. So they boost their returns by being exposed a lot on the alternative strategies. Okay, so that's, that's a bit the sketch of the, of the results. By the way, if there is any question, please feel free to interrupt me 
and happy to, to answer. Okay, so far so good. So let's dig a bit now into the theory uh, and the methodology. And let's start with, uh, with this decomposition when we are dealing with a true model. So true model means that we are able to isolate the factors um, on which the, the fund uh, is, is, uh, is, 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 is boosting or is loaded, so is boosting its, its, its return. So we are interested in the average fund excess return, net of fee. Again, we are taking the viewpoint of an investor. So this is the performance that hedge fund deliver to investor. And so you can basically decompose the average return for fund I at a given time point in terms of two components, AC star and BC star. And AC is nothing else than the alpha of the, of the fund. So this is the alpha component. And BC star, this is basically the sum of the exposure times, the expected value of the mechanical trading strategies, right? So this is a linear combination of all the mechanical trading strategies the fund are exposed to times its exposure, beta star uh, prime. So, in, when, when the model is uh, well specified, uh, the, 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 the estimation strategy is pretty straightforward. So you take each, each fund uh, returns, you regress the fund return against the factor model, you get an estimate for the alpha, you get an estimate for the beta, you can get an estimate for the expect, expected value of the, of the fund, and therefore you get uh, the, the cross-sectional distribution for the, uh, the alpha component and the cross-sectional distribution for the beta component. Right, so this is the, 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 the phi alpha component star and the beta uh, component star. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, if, you, if you look at the paper by Barras and Kotos 2022, it's a, it's a bit more tricky, but I mean, the message is, is, is pretty, pretty straightforward here. So what is the problem now when we deal with the wrong model? So the wrong model and call this model K is a model that includes some of the right factors F, K, I, or included, but at the same time, it omits some of the factors. So F, K for model K, zero or O for omitted. Now, if you are only using F, I, T, K in your set of regressor, you can still run and you can still perform this decomposition, but this will be the decomposition under the wrong model K. And now the, the impact of this decomposition is that the alpha component under model K will contain the true components that you are actually looking for, but will inflate this component by, by what? By the beta exposure times the expected value of the omitted factors, right? So it will, this, if the fund loads positively on factors that deliver positive excess return, then you will inflate positively your alpha component through this missing component here, right? So, so this is the imperfect estimation I, I, I was mentioning. And you cannot estimate directly the phi star for the alpha component and the beta component. You can only estimate the phi, under, phi alpha component and phi beta component under model K, right? But still what we propose here is that we will take a set of wrong models. For each of these models, we will get a distribution phi k, and we will try to identify models that are less prone to misspecification by comparing the phi k distribution for the various k. And here, the idea is that models that are less misspecified, so models for which the factor are relevant, should capture the omitted beta component that actually inflate the alpha. And as a result, the alpha distribution should uh, go left, should go towards closer to zero, right? Because actually here you are capturing strategies that are used by each fund to boost their returns. Now, when you do that, you need to compare several models. You need, a, you need the right testing procedure. And as I was mentioning before, the distribution both for the alpha part and the beta are estimated with noise. And the econometric theory here is not straightforward at all to show how we can derive um, those consistent estimates and uh, standard errors around them. Now, just to give you an idea about the properties, 
of these estimated distributions, let me just take uh, one moment of distribution, which is the, uh, the estimated average. So the alpha bar K here, so it's what is the average of all the alpha for the funds obtained through model K. So that's basically the sum of the alpha at I K, that you, so the sum divided by N, the so cross section N average of the estimated alpha under model K. So what is shown in the paper is that we have double asymptotics. So when N, the number of funds, and T, the number of observation grows large, you have central limit theorem that applies and you have convergence towards uh, a normal distribution, right? So you have consistency. Now, what is interesting and that you see here is that the speed of convergence is not with respect to square root of N, but with respect to the number of observation square root of T. I will come back to this point in a second. So we have consistent estimate and we have normality. So this is great for performing tests. What is missing is the covariance matrix here, but we provide in the paper consistent estimator for the covariance matrix and the model K using the residuals of the misspecified models. We provide also uh, this theorem for other characteristics like other moments, the standard deviation, cross-sectional standard deviation, the proportion, proportion of positive and negative alpha, for instance, and also the quantiles to look at the tails. And moreover, we do that for two models. So when you compare model K and model L, and that's, that's turned to be uh, very important where we will be looking at several sets, uh, well, a set of several uh, misspecified models to see whether they are really different, right? So now let me come back to this square root of N versus square root of T. So when the model is correctly specified, Barras and co-authors have shown that the speed of convergence is with respect to square root of N, where N is the number of funds. And typically you have a large number of, of funds uh, in, the, in the mutual fund industry or in the hedge fund industry. So you have fast convergence where everything goes well. When you have misspecification now, this is square root of T. So the convergence is much slower. And especially with hedge fund where you, you have monthly observation over a couple of years. So square root of T is, is typically small. So this raises the bar for detecting difference across the models, right? So we will see uh, that rejection of two models being equal, being the same is, is less likely uh, to, to happen. And why it's the case, because the omitted factor that is not present in, in the misspecified model will affect all funds. And this can be seen uh, simply from the estimation error of for instance, the sample mean or the cross-sectional mean here that involves the cross-sectional uh, uh, residu uh, residual, yes, cross-sectional uh, residual here that can be decomposed in two parts. One part that is from the well-specified uh, set of factors and this vanishes as N grows. So when N increases, this will tend to zero. But this guy here on the right-hand side will not tend to zero. It will tend to zero when the square root of N, N uh, square root of T increases, but not when the square root of N increases, right? So in order to have, uh, to gain precision, you need to have more and more observation, time series, cross, uh, not cross-sectional observation, but time series observation. Is there any question so far? No? Okay, so now we have the methodology. Let me first dig into the data. So what we do with the data, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, now uh, we are uh, looking at uh, several database uh, in the hedge fund space, dealing with monthly data from 1994 to 2020. We are merging four databases, making uh, sure that we don't have duplicates in the database. So we have a large uh, coverage of funds with four database and we do our best to mitigate any bias uh, you may be aware of uh, when dealing with hedge funds like backfill bias, selection bias or survival, survivorship. In total, we have slightly more than 5,000 funds. We will perform analysis at the overall level but also look at uh, the subcategories I was mentioning. So the styles like equity styles, macro style or the arbitrage. So typically hedge funds in the equity space, they invest only in stocks. Um, macro hedge funds, they will, they will deploy their 
strategies on futures, uh, you know, uh, interest rate futures or commodity futures or uh, in index futures, uh, trying to exploit trends and mean reversion uh, pattern they, they find in the, in the in past data. And arbitrage, they typically relative value funds. So they, they, they exploit arbitrage opportunities in a large set of, uh, of assets like equi equity, uh, commodities, uh, futures, etc. Okay, so fairly straightforward on the on the on the hedge fund data side. Now, re regarding the models, as I as I mentioned before, we start with the most simple model you can imagine, the CAPM that has only one factor, which is the market, and this is this will be our benchmark model because it is the model that is uh, the most likely to be ill-equipped to capture any of the alternative uh, strategies uh, the hedge funds load uh, on uh, in order to boost their returns. Now we, for the first set of standard models, uh, we look at what has been commonly used in the, in the literature so far. So we have the five factor Fama French model with market size value, investments and profitability. We have the Carhart model, which is market size value and momentum. The Fancier model, uh, which is probably the most widely used model for hedge funds because it has market size and then it has bond uh, default and bond term that typically capture credit risk uh, uh, and, uh, and you know the difference between long-term and short-term interest rates. Uh, so typically capturing some exposure the hedge fund have, but also option straddles that are dynamic strategies. So basically those factors have been created in order to capture some of the dynamic strategies followed by hedge funds. This is why Fancier uh, has become a standard. And then Asnes, Moskowitz and Peterson, which is a three-factor model that can be seen as a, an international version of the Fama French uh, three-factor model. And here, this is global value and global momentum because those two factors are not only on the equity space, but also on commodity, um, I, I mean, across various asset classes. So those four guys, these are for us the standard models, and we will be in the first step comparing those four against the CAPM. Then we have two equity-based machine learning models. So uh, by the, the, in the study by Kozak, Nagel, and Santosh, and we have two of these models that have been calibrated on the equity space uh, for the US. Uh, so one model is with five factors that are characteristic-based. Characteristic so various characteristics that you find on the equity space in the US. And then you have, you have a second model, which is a principal component version of the first model. So these are the two machine learning uh, cutting edge, uh, if you want, uh, factor models. And then we built what we call alternative edge fund factor models by reading uh, and by discussing with uh, edge fund managers we, we designed two, uh, well, we took one model from the literature, which is Yuen Vara and others, uh, which is, uh, I think, a standard Carhartt mod, Carhart model plus three alternative factors. I will tell you more in the next slide about what I mean by alternative factors. And then the Carhartt Peterson model, which is a mix between uh, two papers, one by Carhartt and the other by Peterson and co -tors, and that, that encompasses five what we call alternative factors. So what do we mean by alternative factors? They are taken again from past studies. We are not building anything here, just reusing some of this factor that we found in the literature. Typically you have the liquidity factor that actually is a factor that leads to an exposure to uh, illiquid stocks. So you, you get a premium for being um, exposed to uh, non-liquid assets. Typically, this is what you can expect for some of the hedge funds because they, they take position in some you know, uh, uh, assets or um, you have some, some positions that are very liquid. Then you have betting against beta that exploits distortion due to leverage constraints. So here the idea is to have a factor that pot potentially capture leverage exposure. And we know that hedge funds, they, they use leverage a lot. We have the variance factor that is a short position in a variant swap on the SP500. So here, this is a factor that acts a bit like a, an insurance. And that's 
will be capturing any exposition on options. And we know that hedge funds, they are very often using option either to edge or to, to, I mean, to boost their performance. Time series momentum, here this is a factor that favor assets that gain uh, you know, over, the, over the, past, uh, the past months or the past years. So typically trend following strategies. And then we have the carry factor that exploits, uh, you know, uh, uh, typically low forward prices. So that invest in low forward prices across a large set of asset classes, not only equities. So the rationale for those factors uh, comes from, I mean, the trading and uh, the trading used by and deployed by, by these hedge funds uh, in real life. And also the fact that those were used in past studies. So we, we'd like to revisit a bit those uh, edge fund, uh, so th those uh, factor models now with our new methodology. So now we have everything. We have the methodology on one side, we have the edge fund data, and we have the factor models, and we can start playing with that uh, and, and look at the first, uh, the, the first question we had. The first question is, do we see what, what happened to these standard models as compared to the CAPM? Thanks to the new methodology, we, we can now revisit this and see whether we see any misspecification in the standard model. And this is actually what we observe. So by taking the simplest benchmark CAPM and formally, thanks to our methodology, comparing any of those four standard models, what we observe is that they are exactly the same. So it's not only on the average of the cross-sectional distribution that they are the same. It's the whole distribution, alpha distribution, that is similar to the CAPM. So these are as misspecified as the CAPM, meaning that the factors of these models, they do not capture at all the edge fund returns. We find similar results for the machine learning models, but this is not surprising here because despite those models are really uh, you know, cutting edge and taking care of the in-sample, out-of-sample bias, they, they were trained on the equity space. And this is known that hedge funds, they deployed the strategy on, on, on serial asset classes. Now, the second uh, question we had is, what about the alternative models? And in this case, we note a sharp difference for the distribution between those two models and the CAPM. And this is particularly true for the Carhart Pedersen models that includes all the alternative factors. So this highlights really the importance of adding the alternative factors when you want to perform and to isolate alpha from beta. And this is, I mean, this is consistent with the economic intuition because we have ample evidence that these hedge funds, they hold illiquid assets, they take leverage position, they trade variance, they buy cheap assets, and uh, they follow uh, trend following strategies, right? So now that we have this, uh, these results, it completely changes the narrative. Should you use standard models or should you use alternative model? So if you use standard models, what you find is that the relative importance of the alpha, so the alpha component accounts for 54% of the average performance of the fund. 41% is market exposure, and the alternative factor, they only explain 5% of the performance. So you conclude that hedge funds, they deliver high performance to investors, and they are not exposed to alternative source of risk. Now, if you take the alternative models we propose in our paper, the narrative is different. The relative importance of the alpha now is only 6%. The market beta is still 41%. But the beta component coming from the alternative factors is 52% of the average alpha they delivered uh, to the investor. So you conclude that the fund, they, are, they deliver low performance to their investors and they are exposed to many alternative source of risk, right? So let's have a look at the table. And this is a typical table that you'll find in the paper. So each row reports one factor model. So you have the CAPM, which is the benchmark model, the Carhart, Five Factor, Funcier, Asne, Moskowitz, Peterson. You have the two machine learning models, and then you have the alternative model by you and Vara and the Carhart Peterson model. And here each column actually summarizes part of the cross-sectional distribution. You have the mean, standard deviation, 
the negative proportion, the positive proportion, and the quantile for the alpha component. So this table summarizes the alpha component. So if you were using a standard model, so the CAPM, what you observe is that basically the average alpha uh, is the same, is almost 3% per year. So you would conclude that hedge funds deliver 3% alpha per year to their investors, and that the proportion of positive alpha is massive, more than 70%. Right? So that's the first message. The second message is that you don't see any huge discrepancy against these models. And actually when you perform, you see here in parentheses the standard error, and when you perform a statistical test, they are all exactly the same, not only on the average, but also on, on the other components. So basically they are exactly capturing the same. Now, when you turn, when you look down the table and you turn into the, al the alternative factors, you see a sharp de decrease in the alpha, and especially for the CP model. Now it's not 3% per year that is delivered to the investors, but that's 37 basis points, much lower number. And you have only 50% of the funds in the whole universe that deliver positive alpha to investors. So you have a, an a alternative model that leads to a massive shift of the alpha distribution to the left. So this is actually, what you can, what, what we find using a function model, which is the most commonly used model in the edge fund space, you get the kernel density estimates in blue, dotted blue here. If you use the GKKT model or the CP, you see the shift to the left of the, of the alpha distribution of the alpha component. You can do exactly the same for the beta components. And again, the beta components under the uh, Carhart Peterson model, encompass several factors. So you have the market size, illiquidity, betting against beta, variance, carry, and time series momentum. And you can dissect the beta component into each of the subcomponents. Now, if you do that, and you look at the cross-section and distribution of the beta component under the CP model, you see that the market is, actu is actually accounting for 2% per year. And most of the funds load massively on the market, 70 8% of the funds load on the market. You see that for the alternative factors, the, ex the positive exposure is observed for all of them. So more than 50% of the fund load positively on those alternative factors. And some of the alternative factors are actually delivering a high uh, percentage of return, uh, right, uh, of, the, of the average return. So we see that for instance, carry, Variance and time series momentum, we see large numbers for those. Uh, and, and, and again, it makes sense, carry matters for all strategies, whether you are in equity, currency, bond and currency, time, time series momentum is big for all the macro funds such as CTAs and variance matters for arbitrage funds because it captures the option-based strategies followed by, by these funds. So the, when you discuss with hedge fund manager, these results are not surprising to them at all. Let's dig now into, if there is no question, let's dig now into a dynamic analysis. So what you see here on the horizontal axis, this is time. This is the, the performance of mutual funds. So for, for the first picture, let, let me show you mutual fund universe. So what you see with the black line is the, average, is the, the, the alpha uh, of the cross-sectional distribution, uh, distribution for the performance for the mutual funds over time using the Carhartt model, which is a standard model for, for mutual funds. So you see negative alpha. So nothing is surprising here because there are numerous studies that report the negative alpha for the mutual fund industry. And you see that for those funds, after the financial crisis, they got their performance from being a lot exposed to the, to the market. You see also a very small, beta component for the alternative factor, which, which in this case are size, I minus low and momentum, right? So the takeaway from this plot is that it's pretty stable over time in terms of the alpha, it's negative. And then the exposure to the market has increased since uh, the financial crisis. So what about now for the hedge fund space? So this is the plot for the hedge fund. So in black, this is the, the alpha that you see over time and you see a massive decrease of the alpha over time. So 
it seems now that the alpha looks more or less like mutual funds. So basically the, the hedge fund industry is not delivering alpha to their investors. You see, despite being smaller, you see an increase in the market exposure since the financial crisis as well. And you see the large exposure uh, uh, to, the, to the alternative factors for the hedge funds, right? So the takeaway from these plots is that in terms of the market exposure, it's similar than mutual funds. It has increased since 2009. And for the alpha, it's more, it's, 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 it, it, it has become uh, something very neglectable over the recent period. Let me dig into uh, additional uh, results that we find in our, in our analysis. Uh, as I was mentioning, the heterogeneity on the alpha uh, and on the beta component is really large. Uh, the volatility is cross-sectional. Uh, volatility ranges between 6.8% to 9.2% per year, depending on which factor model you take, as compared to 1.4% for the mutual fund industry. So uh, much larger uh, cross-sectional dis dispersion. And you still find a very large dispersion in the beta component, even when looking at styles. So even if you only look at the equity space, the macro space, or the arbitrage space, you still find a lot of variability. So here, this means that the style benchmarking that is very often done by practitioners or even academics is not sufficient here to in order to measure the performance. I was, I, as I was mentioning before, there is a negative correlation between the alpha component and the beta component. So when there is low alpha, you observe high betas. And this is even more true when you look at very negative alphas. In this case, the betas are very high. And this is uh, the way we interpret this is by the fact that the, the, the bad funds, the worst funds, so the fund with the very low alpha tends to hide their lack of performance by being exposed to, uh, high, massively exposed to uh, these alternative strategies. So in conclusion, in this work, we, we are revisiting a bit hedge fund performance. We are, our aim is really to look at the, the cross-sectional distribution of, of the performance and to dissect this performance into an alpha component and a beta component. Now, when dealing with hedge funds, uh, it's likely that the benchmark model that you will be using is misspecified. So you will be missing some of the factors uh, or the mechanical trading strategies that, uh, that uh, the fund is exposed to in order to boost its return. And as such, you will face an imperfect estimation. So basically you have high alpha that are nothing else than even beta and you will face estimation noise in a sense that the emitted factor will impact all funds of the cross section and there is no diversification as the number of funds increases. So we propose in this paper a new approach for estimating and comparing the alpha and beta distribution across the models. Uh, and this helps to revisit uh, some of the empirical results that have been observed so far. Uh, because we are, we are able to sharpen the return decomposition between alpha and beta. So we believe this, this, uh, this methodology is useful to revisit other uh, empirical results in the hedge fund industry, but also maybe to deal with uh, other uh, universe of, um, of funds like mutual funds, but that are likely to be uh, misspecified. And that's typically the case for international that would be typically the case for international mutual funds. I'm done. Thanks a lot for your attention. And now I'm really happy to answer any of your questions.